Hey, power people. Welcome to Renewable Rides, powered by Vector. I'm Gareth Evans, the CEO and founder. And I'm Dan Roberts, head of sales. In each episode, we'll uncover the latest trends, learnings, challenges, and triumphs relating to the energy transition, on-site energy, and sustainability through the experiences of our inspiring guests and team here at Vector. So get ready for an exhilarating adventure into the fast-paced world of challenging limits, adapting purposely, and empowering co-creation to accelerate the energy transition with those that are on a mission to create a more resilient, profitable, sustainable, and thriving energy future. So let's go. All right, and welcome back to another episode of Renewable Rides. And uh, Dan and I are excited to be joined again by James Coombs, our uh, resident finance expert, um, coming to you from Painted Rock. Uh, lots of years of experience financing solar and storage and on-site energy systems. And this is a follow-on from our last episode. And the big takeaways for me was if you're a business leader and you're seeing on-site energy looking like a very attractive option for you in terms of reducing costs, increasing resilience, or helping you achieve your emission reduction targets, there are ways to finance it. But some of the big initial questions you need to ask yourself are, do I own the the asset or the facility? And if not, I need to get my landlord involved. Do I have a tax burden that I want to take advantage of in, in the form of tax credits? And then lastly, do I want to own and operate this asset or do I want someone else to do it? And then this creates multiple different avenues for us to explore in the next few episodes. Uh, today, we're going to dig into the tax incentive side of it. And Dan, this has been turbocharged by the IRA, right? Yeah, appreciate that, Gareth. And and yeah, the, the IRA or the Inflation Reduction Act, which was passed last year in 2022, uh, really uh, leveled up the, the the tax credits for these types of systems. So we're now back up to the 30% essentially kind of baseline tax credit for these systems. Uh, but within the Inflation Reduction Act, there have also been some bonuses included. So these bonuses, uh, the two primary ones that, that we'll, we'll discuss are the energy community bonus and the low income community bonus. Uh, a couple of notes there. The energy community bonus is uh, essentially statutory, or if you fall into that zone, you are going to get that uh, extra 10% bonus. So bringing your, your tax credit up to 40%. Uh, however, the low income community bonus uh, is more of a lottery system where you apply, you enter the lottery, then you get selected. So it's not a guarantee. Uh, but regardless, uh, even if you don't fall into one of these two bonus zones, the, the, these projects are, are great. And uh, James, maybe you can share a little bit more on on how this impacts the, the financing scheme. Yeah, uh, these intros and recaps are helpful because it makes me think, what did we gloss over in the, in the last round or what should we highlight? And so the one thing I wanted to add here, in addition to business leaders, you know, nonprofit organizations have been uh, huge commercial solar adopters. So we say commercial in the solar context to mean anything that's not residential. Uh, it doesn't mean necessarily commercial businesses. So as you are listening, you leaders of houses of worship, you boards of homeowners associations and country clubs, you boards of private schools, among others, uh, you know, this is all for you. And in fact, some of the financing structures we're going to talk about are very designed for you. So broadly, uh, all of those, uh, not just commercial businesses, but certainly commercial businesses as well. Uh, one thing, uh, Dan, I want to highlight is, you know, nothing about the uh, legislation from last year is something I would call revolutionary. Well, for certain projects, they will have some disproportionate impact. Uh, by and large, the benefits are either incremental or simply replicate a great uh, kind of policy infrastructure already in place for solar. And um, while we could certainly break out and talk about different states, you know, in concept, um, we have great uh, net metering rules. And even though California, for example, has had a big change in net metering, uh, you know, let's keep in mind, we have a good uh, solar metering policy in place. And the fundamental uh, federal incentive is the investment tax credit at 30%. Uh, 
And along with that, it's not even a solar specific incentive. It's just under the principle that, you know, things that reduce the tax burden of projects are going to help get you more, more projects. Uh, you can uh, accelerate your depreciation and depreciate these on a five to six year time frame. So that's the fundamental policy place that existed before and still exists. It's why, uh, you know, solar commercial solar in general is not a new phenomenon. And while it's certainly kind of increasing in uptake as you have more organizations going through the development process and awareness and, you know, kind of seeing their peers do these projects, uh, we didn't have a sea change in policy. What we had is some things that will help, uh, hopefully maybe even over time more than immediately build a bit more efficient financing uh, marketplace. Um, but overall, if you had a good opportunity before, you still do. And then maybe perhaps we can break out, like you said, and talk about a couple of the specific adders and how they'll affect certain customers in certain areas disproportionately. So James, if, I've a, if I'm a business and like many of these systems already pencil without the tax credits, you know, they've got very good returns on investment, good payback periods. If I'm a business that has a tax um, liability, let's call it, and I invest in an onset energy project, is it as simple as saying for every dollar I spend, I'm getting 30 to 50 cents on the dollar back in terms of a tax benefit? Just talk us through that in kind of simple terms for business leaders thinking about their, their finances. Short answer is yes, to answer your question. It, it is or can be that simple. Uh, again, prefaced on the big question, which is do you have... So the tax credit is... And people in the industry know this, but for those not, we sometimes take it for granted. The tax credit is not a deduction. It is a dollar for dollar credit. So you are reducing. So it's irrespective of what tax bracket, for example, you're in. We'll be talking to some C-Corps that are in the 21% bracket and some, you know, LLCs where the owners are going to be in the 30, mid 30s tax brackets. The tax credit itself is a dollar for dollar credit. 30% on a million dollar project costs 300,000. You directly reduce your federal tax liability and you can carry that forward uh, for a period of years. Good time to highlight that not only uh, do we recommend you consult with whoever's the professional doing your taxes uh, and that we're not here to provide you specific tax advice. We do welcome talking with tax preparers, your CPAs, your CFOs to talk through what we've seen and ensure they have the guidance to help you make these decisions. Uh, but it's really advisable because uh, every partner we work with is gonna have some level of tax planning that they're doing. And we wanna ensure that they can integrate this thinking in with their tax planning. Or if you have planned away how you're going to uh, your, your federal tax liability, then let's structure something for you like we talked about in the last episode where uh, our investors are monetizing that um, for you. Uh, but that's a good high-level kind of reminder that that tax credit question is important to the economics of solar. And Gareth, while I agree with what you said, many projects would work or cash flow in their own right. The reality is that's not true in every state. It's true no. in the higher power cost states. Uh, and even then... The proposition is not so attractive in all cases and specifically for all kind of utilities, for all utilities and for all utility rate tariffs that it's that initial sort of 30% credit that makes so many projects go from being not viable on a standalone basis to being viable. Yep. Uh, and that's why I say that kind of policy infrastructure is what gets us there. So if that credit went back to 10%, there'd be a lot of larger projects that would still work, but it's that base 30% credit that makes so many, as you drive around your town and you see modules on the roofs of uh, synagogues and commercial office buildings and cold storage facilities, it's that 30% that made those projects work. Nice. To segue uh, from that, just to jump down into it. So uh, Dan, as you talked about, there's a few different types of, we call them tax credit adders. Uh, and so I would, as you, as, you, as you mentioned, break this out into the ones that you can really uh, go into more comfortably and the ones where I would advise 
caution because what we've seen, and we now have a pretty long track record in solar. Uh, and those of us in the industry have this expression, the solar coaster, uh, to sort of refer to this ongoing fluctuation of federal, state, local, and utility policies and how they impact uh, solar. Uh, and so uh, some of these may be available, but the challenge is that, A, you fundamentally have a project that works well without them. And in the process of setting expectations, some customers will develop unrealistic expectations. For example, hey, this uh, other customer that happens to be in what we call an energy communities zone is eligible for some tax credit adder. Well, I want the same adder when the baseline reality is that their project works well and is economic, highly economic as it is. And we don't want the inachievable perfect to become the enemy of the very achievable, very economic, very good uh, solar project, whether they pay cash or finance. We want to make sure people go in with a good expectation. And so that's why I've specifically with respect to this concept of low-income communities, adders, those are both subject to a cap on allocation, an application process, a backlog, a queue, and some subjectivity in their award. And so I think of it as potential eligibility based on geographic location. And there are census tract maps that people can consult that kind of show you this. But the reality is this isn't intended to give a freebie 10% to businesses that happen to be located in an area that shows up as you know red, meaning highly eligible on that map just because they're there. And I think as we've just entered into an application window for the first round, uh, you know, the second issue is that even if you are eligible and all that, if you didn't get in for that application window, then you're going to have to push your project back another 12 months, possibly get in the line for another application window to possibly get that award. Uh, and again, we've made, we've taken what could be a very good deal on its own and now kick the can down the road because of some incremental benefit that may or may not be achievable. Yep, got it. So if I want to self-finance a system, I come up with my own capital, I pay my million bucks, I deploy my solar storage system, I use my tax expert to capitalize on minimum tapes and tax credit, potentially some adders to get me between 40 50%. If I then don't want to finance it and I get someone else to finance it and they take advantage of those tax credits, do those benefits get passed on to me as the, the business owner or how does yeah. that work? Yeah. So great question. This is why it's helpful to have these targeted, focused uh, focused questions. We could go real deep on some elements of the legislation, but as I said, like we have a great baseline value proposition, so let's focus on that. Yeah. Uh, I want to highlight that when we talk about financing the tax credits, uh, we're talking about passing the benefit of the credit through in the form of a lower cost to the customer. So uh, there was, so I wanted, let's step aside and talk about, there was this concept of the direct pay tax credit in the uh, legislation from last year. So while the concept of direct pay itself is new, I need to emphasize, and that's so it applies to nonprofit customers, IRS designated nonprofit entities, and municipal customers. So while that direct pay concept is new, entities that didn't pay federal taxes could not previously directly absorb or take advantage of the tax credit. They could nonetheless, through financing, realize the benefit of the tax credit. So it it's not new. It didn't create a 30% option where there was never anything there before. And if you look at our list of projects financed on our site, uh, on our prior fund site at creditcorp.com and so on, you'll see a long list of nonprofit customers where we had a structure, typically a power purchase agreement, where the investor takes advantage of, monetizes the investment tax credit, and is selling power to the customer at a rate that reflects that federal tax benefit that they're taking advantage of. And that applies today because when we do talk about adders and as we talk about the energy communities adder, which is kind of the one we view as where all investors, lenders are more comfortable with, when we finance that, that 
uh, that savings as well is passed into a lower financing cost. So you should understand it because it'll affect what's available or not available to you, whether you're paying cash or financing. Uh, and uh, just to highlight that that concept of monetizing the credit under that direct pay is great for some partners that want to go through that. It also introduces some complexity for, well, how do I apply for and get that benefit? Because it involves filing tax returns or going through a portal. And there are things that are going to add some complexity on there where, hey, we may be able to do another financing structure where for a nonprofit or municipal customer, that's not your responsibility to have to worry about. We have investors that do this on a regular basis. We'll go through that process. And if you look at the financing cost and the things you get for it, uh, I think there's a lot of compelling reasons to continue to do it the way we have been doing things for you know a decade or more, financing the tax credit. Yeah. James, worth, worth noting for our listeners, um, especially as we look at projects that are um, you know, decent size projects in the two, five, ten million dollar size, the, the the tax credits can be be rather sizable, and they may not be able to take care of uh, take advantage of that credit in in that first year, the year that the project was financed, or the year that project was commissioned. You can carry these forward, correct? Yes, and always a great opportunity to reiterate uh, the tax discussion we're having here is not tax advice that you should on your own file your tax return based on. It's a disclaimer because it is, but it's also saying that we want every customer to go out there and, and sync with their tax people who, to be candid, often stand in the way of deals because uh, they haven't uh, been involved in the planning process and then they come in late in the process. This is particularly in sort of like a big company environment uh, and it's a different you know group within the firm and all that and they haven't been integrated into that conversation. So whether you're a uh, sole proprietor and your CPA does your taxes or a big company and you've got a whole division in another city that does your taxes, um, integrate that conversation. Particularly, we see a lot of LLCs. I'm pivoting from part of what you asked because uh, I did want to touch on LLCs where a lot of developers go in thinking I have a for-profit business. They'll take the tax credit, but the LLC structure with different members and all that really complicates the ability for that business as a business uh, to 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 recognize that tax credit benefit. And that's another case where a uh, a lease or a PPA, or we can also talk about a tax credit sort of uh, transfer structure uh, can really come into play for, for different types of, uh, of business structures, depending on how they pay taxes. Yeah, so I can transfer them as well. So if I don't want to monetize them myself, um, it's, yeah. Transfer or sell them to other people. Is that correct? So that's why, and yes, to pivot back to the question you asked, as you get to larger and larger customer sizes, another yep. element of the 2022 legislation is this concept of tax credit transferability. I want to highlight that that is new across the board. And I think most of the folks, we're not a direct practitioner in that, and there's not really a big market for it yet, but you'll see the companies that are out there working on those types of things those are generally going to be targeted towards very large projects. I would say particularly utility scale projects, which is outside the scope of commercial. But even in the commercial realm, they're going to be talking about multi-megawatt, you know, multi-multi-million dollar projects. Uh, there is not a direct tax credit transfer market for the, you know, standard million dollar project on the street. There may be at some point. Yeah. But what I can say is we do have an alternate structure that has existed for a while. Uh, where investors will effectively get you, you won't get 100 cents on the dollar uh, on effectively transferring your tax credit. Uh, yeah. But for a customer that says, as we touched on in the first episode, hey, I've got the capital. I'm just looking for somebody to help me monetize value for the tax credit. Uh, we've already got structures where we can do that uh, with an investor partner. Uh, and so that's on the table as well. But as you get to those bigger in dollar amounts, you absolutely can transfer them forward. Okay, so I got the disclaimer in there that talk to your tax advisor, your tax planning, all of that, but you absolutely can carry them forward. And so the question for a lot of folks is, hey, if I can take it over two or three years, then I'm going to do that. But, you know, everybody who tells me they've got an NOL 
sitting there from something so they're not paying taxes for you know the foreseeable years would rather just hit the easy button uh, and use a structure where somebody else monetizes that credit for them so they're not sitting there with that kind of residual tax credit every year trying to figure out if they can finally take advantage of it. All the more reason it's great to just get on the phone with everybody right up front and talk through, you know, hey, what's the, you know, what's the right way for you to think about this? Because we talked to some folks, and as I mentioned, even some large corporations that say, yeah, we could take this, but if the financing structure can capture it for us, and possibly there's even some ancillary benefits in there, then we just prefer to do it the, you know, the easy way. Yeah. So if someone else, if I had the easy button and someone else takes care of it for me, typically is that open book, James, like as the buyer of the energy solution um, and someone else is financing it, taking the tax credits. Should I be expecting that to be open book or am I happy to just get a flat rate for energy and it's the same or lower than what I pay today and I don't have a clue how the other entity is dealing with the tax credits? Uh, So we could talk about open book in a couple different ways. What I will say is this, particularly when it comes to the adders, is that we'll be transparent. So if we're going to say price a deal based on an assumption of a standard 30% tax credit, but we think we can get the energy communities adder in particular, then we'll be very transparent. Hey, look, if we get this, then your pricing is going to be you know, this. And if for some reason the project is deemed ineligible, there is going to be some periodic revision of the, geograph- the geographical boundaries for the energy communities credit then, hey, your pricing may you know, revert back to this. I'd say every lender and investor that's doing this will have their own sort of process there. But we're going to be open book or transparent in the sense that you're going to know that it's not a wild card. And if we happen to get that adder, you know, the investor is going to keep uh, all of it. So have that conversation, whether it's through us and our partners or through others that you're talking to, have that, you know, have that conversation with them. Yeah, cool. I think just to round out this conversation on um, self-financing, capturing the tax credits, you mentioned depreciation before. That's obviously another big lever. Do you want to just give us a highlight into the value of how these assets can be depreciated? Yeah, yeah. So there's the concept of accelerated depreciation for eligible assets, particularly solar and and energy storage assets at the federal level. Every state's different. uh, And so they don't, it's important that they don't treat it exactly the same way as the federal legislation does. But in concept, so you're buying an asset, uh, you'll have a depreciable asset uh, at the federal level. Typically that's a five year Uh, Even without what we call bonus depreciation, you have accelerated depreciation, which means you can typically depreciate it over five years or technically six if you're on some sort of a half year uh, convention with more of the depreciation weighted to the front end of that. Uh, What that means in actual cash uh, benefit to customers is that's a real reduction in your federal income tax liability. And that is unlike the tax credit which is a dollar for dollar reduction, the depreciation value is dependent on your marginal tax rate. So when we do have uh, uh, LLCs or in some cases sole proprietors or LPs uh, that aren't paying a 21% corporate rate, they're paying at the individual level often upwards of 30%, uh, percent, that depreci- depreciation is even more valuable to you in that uh, context. Now, the bonus means uh, you're getting even more front end accelerated depreciation. But even as the concept of bonus depreciation steps down, even this year, next year, you're still depreciating essentially half or more of that system uh, price in the first year. Um, in a more detailed discussion, you could talk about exactly what the depreciable basis is. I'll note that you typically remove half of the value of the investment tax credit that you took at the federal level to get your federal depreciable basis. So in a 30% case, deduct half of that 15%, you're gonna have an 85% depreciable basis. But for everybody who hardwired 85% in their spreadsheets, please remember that when you're talking about a bonus or sorry, an adder, and you're now getting 40%, okay, you're gonna reduce 20% to get your depreciable basis of 80% and you're gonna depreciate it from there. And then all the accelerated depreciation is based on that 80% basis. I will also note that certain smaller businesses may be eligible for Section 179A deductions. 
definitely talk to your tax preparer on that one, where you still may be able to deduct, deduct 100% of the system basis in the first year if you're in that window of who's eligible for Section 179A. Well, James, appreciate the overview here. A lot of nuance. I think the uh, the exciting thing is is uh, we, we've we've got some stability in, in the tax credits, at least uh, at least for the foreseeable future with the Inflation Reduction Act. I, uh, I I also just want to underscore as I've been listening to you share more about this. We talked in a previous episode how these are assets. So when we think about a variety of different things in the energy space, there's offsite PPAs and other mechanisms for for decarbonization, for example. But when you're deploying solar storage and, and other assets, these are these are assets, and so there's tax ramifications associated with it that can lead to a lot of great benefits. Um, I will note uh, that, and we'll put these in the show notes, that um, we just uh, yesterday, November 1st, we're recording here on November 2nd, uh, had a press release uh, talking about uh, some of the benefits and some of the things that we've incorporated into the Vecta platform, as well as a white paper on the Inflation Reduction Act to provide a bit more insights. I believe you also have some information on the, the, the Painted Rock Capital uh, website, which is uh, paintedrockcapitalgroup.com. And we'll again put those in the show notes. Any closing thoughts here, James, before we move on to the next uh, couple episodes? Uh, the next one focused on PPA and leasing, and then the last one focused on debt and PACE. Yeah, I was just going to say, that's the kind of fork we're at here, which is if the customer's looking for tax credit monetization, which I encourage any nonprofit customer, you're going to be in that bucket. Then we have the session on PPAs and leases. And then for customers that are monetizing directly, we have the session on forms of debt, unsecured loans, PACE, uh, capital leases we'll touch on and and self-financing with your secured lender. So we'll touch on that. So you can listen to both, but that's the sort of pivot point we're at in the conversation. Awesome. Excellent. Thanks for your expertise. See you on the next Thanks one. Thanks for having us as always. We receive a lot of questions from business leaders around the world wanting to learn more about the energy transition, what is possible and where to start. So to help you stay informed and up to date on best practices, opportunities, risks, and success stories, we created an industry news feed at vector.com forward slash news with all our podcasts, blogs, and newsletter. Check it out and connect with Dan, myself, and the Vector team to learn more. Cheers and have a good one.